businesses don't think that just because you could raise money, you have expertise on these things. It's different. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have Jeff Greenberg back on the show. Jeff, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. Yeah, man. It has been forever since uh, you've been on the show. We are just talking. Uh, it's been a long time since we've uh, seen each other and talked with each other. I, I, I'm kind, kind of thinking it was around like 2022, but I might just be totally off, but it's been a while. So welcome back to the show anyways. Uh, Jeff is a CEO and founder of Synergetic Investment Group, uh, SIG. So Jeff, how are you doing, man? What's been going on? I am having a great time. I'm loving life. Um, having fun with my funds, uh, getting to know some sponsors and digging into things, you know, yeah. having a great time. Love it. Love it. So a little bit about Jeff, 20 years uh, in real estate, including 13 years as a multifamily syndicator. Uh, Jeff now considers himself a recovering syndicator, <laughs> but you're still syndicating though. It's just a different, just different, right? Uh, <laughs> he currently manages two customizable, diversified uh, private equity funds. Um, and these funds are invested in over 2000 multifamily units, uh, mobile home parks, uh, short-term rentals, a debt fund, and uh Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin mines. Is that what you'd say? Mining, Bitcoin mining, mining, Bitcoin mining. Yeah. Uh, so, and then, you know, trying to looking at other, uh, diversified assets to get into and to make sure that as investors are getting the best, uh, you know, high quality investment opportunities possible. So with that said, Jeff, um, let's talk about, kind of how you got started in this game. And then I want to work through this transition. Uh, as far as getting started, I mean, that was quite a quite a while ago, I guess in 2005, when I started looking at real estate, uh, mainly single families, so uh, it was bank owned stuff, foreclosed properties. Um, and that wasn't a great time to be to be doing it. When I bumped into a guru that was uh, doing commercial real estate and uh, found out that I could, uh, I didn't have to rely on my money, that I could work with other people's money and get into bigger deals beyond my imagination. And that's mm -hmm. once I started learning about commercial real estate, then I never looked back. Uh, bought my first property in 2010. And it was the first time I'd ever raised money. And from there, then just kept on going until more recently with the funds. And we could talk more about that. Yeah. So what was that? How big was that first uh, raise? Our first raise was 350K. And we were total panic. We, the, my partner and I had never raised a penny before. And, uh, that was a challenge that hmm. was, <laughs> we, we were fortunate though, that this was 20 units, but it was actually five fourplexes hmm. and it was owned by two different owners and we were struggling. We had enough to buy, I believe two of the five. And all of a sudden in the middle of the night, I realized wait a minute, why can't we close on those two and then continue raising the money for the other three? And we got the sellers okay on it. And we did that. So we bought two of them. And I think four or five months later, we bought the other three. So that was that was our diving into uh, raising capital. But we were fortunate that we were able to do it that way. Yeah, well, and it was a lot more challenging time in 2010. Right. Uh, yeah. Seller was definitely probably motivated. Uh, and investors are probably not quite as motivated to invest in a deal in that, 2010. They're nervous about what the heck's going on. Real estate, man, I mean, 2010, real estate just had a bad name. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is these, 
these owners were also the developers and <laughs> they built the properties in 2007. So the oh. properties were only three years old, but they were sitting on them and they hated being the managers. They didn't want to be property managers. They were developers. And we were fortunate that they wanted out. And we were also fortunate that the bank wanted them out because they were terrible um, as far as making their payments. The, the bank should have foreclosed on them a long time ago. Um, hmm. The one guy was three years behind on his taxes hmm. and they could have foreclosed on them. So the bank was excited about getting us in. They wanted us to take this over so they didn't have to deal with these guys. So that was that worked out well for us. Yeah, that's that's a good motivating factor to get, to get the property off the books and to work with you as well when you have a problem raising and say, well, we got to work with this guy because we got we got to get rid of these properties. Uh Jeff, so so I wanna I wanna talk about this transition. So from 2010, how, how long were you syndicating? From 2010 to uh 2010 to well, I'm still I still have well, one deal left. So I guess I'm still <laughs> well, when I was guess I'm last... still a syndicator. My yeah, last yeah. acquisition, um that would have been the Amarillo property. That was about 2019. Okay. So we, we bought it in 2019, sold it in 21. Yep. So yep. that would have been the last one. And and that was the straw that kind of broke the camel's back as far as syndicating. Yeah. So I want to talk about that. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why would you go from being an active syndicator and, and by by active, I'm, you know, Jeff was, you know, running some of this day to day. He's taking the, probably, probably doing a lot of the asset management calls, uh, traveling to properties. Um, you're, you're part of it, right? Um, why did you stop doing that and decide it's better to make a transition? Well, just to, to clarify, I was the main GP. I've had, different partners um i had one partner we were together and were pretty exclusive for about five years broke that off i did a couple de well i did the one deal that oxford deal we were talking about i did that one totally by myself which i would never wish on anybody uh to do a commercial real estate deal by themselves um but that one i did then after that i worked with a few partners um and on the Am, uh, excuse me, the Amarillo deal. Um, I was going towards trying to figure out another way that I didn't want to do all the stuff involved with acquisitions because everybody thinks, okay, acquisitions, you know, once you get the property, hey, you've made it to the finish line. Well, that just doesn't work that way. You've made it to the starting line once you've bought the property. Yeah. And now yeah. you've got all the other stuff. And I brought, this was 225 units. And so I brought on a lady to do the asset management because mm -hmm. I really didn't want to do the asset management. She didn't want to be an employee. So I brought her onto the GP team. So she became part of our team and watching her work and seeing how much better she was as an asset manager just kind of pushed me over the edge. I said, look, all I want to do is work with people like her. You know, if I could help people like her bring in the money, help be of some benefit to them, I'll let them do all the work. They do a much better job than I normally would. And they enjoy it. And that wasn't what I enjoyed. And so that was pretty much what pushed me to the next level. And so since then, I've invested in two of her deals that she did as the main GP. Um, I I helped raise money for her deals, and I'm still in those deals, and she runs them, and I'm happy, you know, knowing the type of person that she is, how she's running those deals, and I'm comfortable bringing investors in. And since then, there's other people that I've known for a long time. I've invested with them. And there's other people that I'm meeting and learning about that we're investing, but yep. it's, it's all about the sponsor to me. It's all about the, who's operating the deal, who's doing the, the asset management, who's running the show. 
Um, the investment comes second. To me, it's who's the operator. And she was so awesome that, you know, I put my trust in her as well as a few others that I've put my trust in. You know, it, it, it's probably really helpful that you've been the active, you know, the, the, the GP on these deals. And then now you've transitioned to being the guy that's raising the funds and bringing the funds, but you know what you're looking for as you're looking at these deals. You, you know, what's key to success and what's key to failure. Cause you've certainly probably done both. Right. So what are some of those things that you really dive into as you're looking, as you're talking with the sponsors, you're looking at a deal, what are you really thinking about uh, to decide, is this the right fit for our group? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I want to mention that besides multifamily, I look at other types of deals, as you mentioned, mobile home parks and short-term rentals. And I don't claim to be an expert in those areas. So back to your question, Again, it's the sponsor. I'm looking for the team. I want to see how well they work together, what kind of KPIs they have, you know, uh, what what metrics are they using to keep control on their property, how they deal with uh, property management. Because usually there's either third-party management or they have in-house. A lot of them do have in-house management companies. And... A lot of people like that. Others don't like that. But either way, it's having good, competent property management and a relationship with them. But the communication is real important. What kind of communication do they put out to investors, uh, letting investors know what's going on? How do they handle rough times in the past? Yeah. You know, what you know, what did they do when there was a problem? You know, they just throw up their hands and say, you know, here, you know, take it. I'm out of here. Or did they dig in or maybe even sometimes brought in their own money to salvage a deal? Um, what do they do when there's problems? But I really want to get deep inside of the team that's running the deal. And I want to know their personalities, you know, you know, what, you know, what they do when the going gets rough, because we all know that there's plenty of issues that happen and how they handle it. You know, do they step up the communication when things are bad or do they ghost you and disappear somewhere? You know, I want to check that out uh, on a deal where we're doing due diligence right now. We just had interviews with the, the uh, people in the group and we went into their personal life. We wanted to know all kinds of stuff about them. We want to know their history. We do background checks where we can, see that when they were 20 years old, they were had a few speeding tickets. <laughs> you know, uh, you know I, I don't have too much of a problem with those, but we're looking to see if there's anything else, if they have any criminal record, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. um, anything in their background, bankruptcies. We do want to know about the people and we dig real deep. Uh, th that's really good. And I mean, it, when you think about it, if you're listening to this and you're an LP, and these are the things that Jeff is doing to protect his LPs. And he's he's really acting on behalf of the LPs. And so as an LP, you should be doing the same thing, right? As a GP, you want to be making sure you're checking those boxes. So what kind of metrics and KPs are you hitting? What kind of team do you have in place? Are you in-house or your third party? And, and what does that look like? How good are you at either of those? How good's your communication? You know, those are big things. Think about what Jeff just said, because that's whether you're a GP or an LP, those are the things you need to be thinking about on your operation side. Um, Jeff, what are you most excited about as far as asset class today? Is there any asset class you're most excited about? And is there anything you just are saying, I'm not even going to touch? Well, I mean, I have a lot of multifamily and so I'm kind of staying away from it right now. I know there's some good deals coming through, um, but I think they're going to get better. I think there's going to be more distress coming down the road. I don't think we're done with it. Yeah. Um, just the other day I was reading about some well-known 
opportunities that kind of fell apart. Um, but right now we are looking at a deal with some land flippers, which is bringing in some huge cash flows and very limited risk. And we're just about to start a raise probably this week on this raw land where mm. they're flipping over a hundred deals a year and making some phenomenal returns for investors. Um, be, what I'm really looking for right now is cash flow. Yeah. Um, and that's this land deal uh, is really bringing in cash flow. People think, okay, land doesn't bring in cash flow, but it does when you flip it. When yeah. you flip it, there's there, there's cash coming in. So looking at that, looking at a couple other people that are doing uh, RV parks that start with some cash flow right off the bat. Um, so multifamily typically doesn't get a lot of good cash flow. You may get a real kicker at the end, but mostly looking for different deals that will give us higher cash flow. And then because my fund is customizable, people can diversify into both cash flowing deals and capital appreciation deals. And they could do their own balancing act so they can adjust it the way that they want as far as which assets they put into their own personal portfolio. That's that's really cool. So if you say, hey, I I don't care about cash flow. I'll, I'm happy with a riskier deal that has the bigger upside. Mm -hmm. You can go ahead and do that. Or you can say, look, I, I want a little bit of both or I just want pure cash flow. Um, you can look at it and, and decide which one you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could bring in we could bring in development deals and development deals. You're typically not going to see anything yeah. for 18 to 24 months or longer. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So but the for the most part, it seems that I have my investors haven't been real excited about that. So that's why we're looking more at the cash flow. Cash flow. Um, you know, when when people are nervous, they like to see their money come back sooner. And higher cash flow gets them their capital back. In fact, this deal, we're supposed to get our capital back uh, a little after three years, that all the cash flow plus uh, cash back. So yeah. that's why that's this great. one uh, excites me. Yeah, that, that's definitely great. That's an exciting return. Um, is there any asset class that you, st you say... I mean, either you've experienced it already and, and you didn't like it or just you, as you look around, you're like, this is not for us. Well, I'm staying away from the Bitcoin stuff. I mean, I've got some Bitcoin investments and I'm done with that. Uh, is there a once, reason for once that? Once this one's out. Well, you know, it, I don't I don't care for the volatility of it. Right yeah. now it's up. Yeah. But it doesn't excite me anymore. I mean, we, we've got one deal with the Bitcoin and that's, that's enough. I mean, we did it mainly for the cash flow, and, uh, you know, it's cash flowing, but I'll stick with real estate. That's not real estate. I'll tell you what the nice thing about the Bitcoin mining was when we got it, we got about a 98% uh, depreciation on that. Hmm. Um, mainly because uh, almost all the money went for purchase of equipment mm, and it's all you know it. it's all five year yeah. five year and that was when there was a hundred percent bonus depreciation so that was nice that we got to write off close to a hundred percent of what we yeah. put into the deal <laughs> so and i needed it at the time because we had just sold some properties yeah. and same with my investors they were able to get that that depreciation so that was nice at that point gotcha and, and so the bitcoin was for it so it's a for starting up mining Bitcoin, and now it's a cash flow play because they're, they're, I'm assuming they're mining it. Uh, yeah. I, don't, I don't even know how Bitcoin really works too too much or something like yeah. that works. Interesting. Um, what is, what have you learned? What's a mistake that you've made and, and what have you learned from it? As far as on the LP side or on the GP as side? As far as any of this side, <laughs> just what do you want to, you got to just pick, just pick one out of a hat here and, and just like enlighten us. Well, the, I'll mention the things that I'm seeing right now. Yeah. The big thing is, is 
one debt okay debt debt can be a killer so if i'm looking at a deal i want to see what the debt is i want to see if it's variable debt i want to see you know uh what the leverage is um you know all kinds of stuff within the debt but the other thing is in the one area that we almost got into trouble with was um be being insufficiently funded um not raising enough capital and getting into a deal and saying oh the lenders going giving me a you know a, a, a 2. 2.5 million dollar uh capex allowance so i'm not going to raise any extra money yeah. i'm just going to rely on that yeah big big mistake yeah because one you have to go spend money first of all to do the capex and then you have to go back to the lender to plead with them to give give your money to them yeah. and um when times get tough i know some people that the lender said no we're not giving you the money times are tight you know um you're not doing what we told you to do or whatever so we're not yeah. giving you this money so now you're on out even the money that you had already put into it um so making sure you have sufficient um funds and not just relying on the reimbursement from the lender because that sometimes you have to fight for yeah i mean read your loan documents very carefully likely oh that, absolutely yeah and like likely the lender can cut that off if they and for a lot of reasons like a lot of reasons that you th would think well that that's why, why would they cut it off for that reason so a lot of times it's on their own discretion. Sometimes it's on their own discretion. Sometimes yeah. it's covenants that you have to hit. And, and those are, you know, if you're in the middle of renovation, impossible what, to hit. Your debt uh, covered ratio, your debt yeah. yield. Yeah. All those you know, kinds you, of stuff. You miss any of those. I mean, we went from 85% occupied um, on purchasing a property down to 66% um, within three months. Yeah. Because we were clearing out, clearing out the, I get the non-payers. The non-payers. Um, yeah. I was going to say something else, yeah, but yeah, I'll yeah, just yeah. say <laughs> we'll keep it clear. But just just clear clearing out, and because of that, that put us down in a negative um, debt coverage, yeah. and we fought our way back up. And this was in the middle of COVID, and we were progressing up. We were going up and up, but the covenant said, you know, that we had to reach a a uh, certain debt yield and every time they were calculating the debt yield they would calculate the previous 12 months now in the beginning we didn't have 12 months so they'd go back to the beginning but every time they would calculate it we could never get to that debt yield because they were calculating our revenue all the way back from the beginning when we were negative yep and we were making great progress but the lender was giving us a bad time because, you know, they, they didn't look at the past three months. They were looking the past 12 months and really stressing us. And uh, that was not a good situation. Yeah, I had a similar experience and the lender would hold my draw request for six, eight weeks, sometimes mm -hmm. longer. And so now I got uh, contractors that are pissed off because mm -hmm. I can't pay them. And I'm trying to have them continue to do work. Well, I should have already paid them. They are trying to do continue. They're trying to continue doing their work. And a, now they're threatening to walk off the job. Luckily, they, it, we kept it flowing because we did have enough capital, but it was still tight. When the lender is putting the squeeze on you, it can get pretty tight pretty quick. So uh, yeah. that's def definitely good. Yeah. Raise enough capital and whatever you think is enough, probably double that uh, because it, yeah. You can never have too much. Uh, what do you think about variable debt right now in today's market? And if you're looking at uh, somebody's deal and they got variable debt, are, are you uh, interested in that deal or not? Not really. I stay yeah. away from it as much as possible. Now, I do know some people that are doing some pretty good stuff to protect themselves um, where they're one paying down, paying down points so they get a better interest rate. Mm -hmm. And then they're also... Um, taking on a, a rate cap that's at par mm -hmm. so it can't go up at all because they're paying for that rate cap but even with that 
you know, that, that still makes me uncomfortable. Yep. So I, I pretty much stay away from it. I do like the loan assumptions when you can assu assume a, a fixed de uh, rate deal. I'm yep. in, a, I'm in several of those, you know, um, I'd rather do loan assumptions and yep. get a 3%, you know, we're in one, it's a 3.8, another 4% or something fixed rate for the next seven years. I yep. like those a lot better. I mean, as long as you don't have to vastly overpay for the property, right? There can be a premium up to an extent, but- Well, the other thing is the prepayment penalty. Prepayment, you know, yep. If you want, and that's the complaint that, that those that are still doing bridge have is that they've got a prepayment penalty at the end. So my feeling is, is, okay, we might not be able to sell for the price we want when we want because of the prepayment penalty, but we're not going to lose the property because of it. Yeah. Well, and- I don't think enough people are doing the math and thinking about it. When you have a bridge debt with a prepayment panel, or sorry, with uh, without the prepay, you, but you have the bridge debt, you got to buy the rate cap, you got to go through all of that, the interest rates higher. When you put all those fees in place and you could just go buy, go get an agency debt and raise the re renovations up front, mm -hmm. you, it's the prepay is not going to, cost you any more money than all the fees and the rate cap and all that stuff that the bridge lender. You're absolutely right. If you've got not. to pay, if you've got to pay $2 million for a rate cap, you know, yeah. how much of a prepayment penalty are you going to have? Yeah. You know, I mean, I'd, ra I'd rather risk that. Yeah. hundred um, <clears> percent. <throat> what is some advice you would give somebody that's looking to raise capital uh, for uh, whether it's for their own deal or another deal, whatever, somebody that's looking to raise capital, what's your advice for somebody just kind of starting out, getting, getting ready, getting going? Find a bunch of other people that are knowledgeable in doing it and in, in raising the capital. I mean, I, I see a lot of fund managers that have never gone through running deals. Mm -hmm. And they make me nervous as hell. Mm -hmm. um, they go and look at the numbers, but they don't really understand what's behind it. Um, makes me real nervous. Um, I'm working with a group that we have, we have probably 50, 50 fund managers to get together. And we watch, we uh, have presentations of deals. And if we get five managers that want to go into the deal, we go into the due diligence together. We go in and, and put hours and hours into the due diligence. Interesting. And I won't do it any other way. Now, I have people coming to me all the time saying, hey, are you interested in raising for my deal? I said, well, you bring your presentation and I'll take a look at it. And if there's other fund managers that want to go in with it, we'll go in with it together. But the amount of time that it takes mm. to do proper due diligence on a sponsor and the deal isn't worth my time these days. Yeah. Time is my most valuable possession at this point in my life. And my best protection for my investors is proper due diligence. Yeah. And I'm not going to be able to do that myself. But if I've got four or five other fund managers, we divvy it up and we do different pieces of it. Uh, I'd much rather go that way. So I would say, a new fund manager or somebody that wants to raise the money, you know, find a group like that where you've got a bunch of people doing it and can properly do it and has the expertise in that area. I might have an expertise in multifamily and student housing, but I was working with other people when we were talking about mobile home parks, um, looking, talking to other people on short-term rentals, people that had short-term rentals. Yep. Um, the thing with the land, um, we've been doing a lot of digging into the land stuff and, and flipping land and whatever, but finding others besides the sponsor that has expertise that we could really evaluate what they're saying. Yeah. Because, you know, they're supposedly an expert, but we need a third party to come in and say, Hey, these are the things you need to look at in this particular asset type. So that's the main thing is don't think that just because you could raise money, you have expertise on these things. It's different. That 
that is so valuable and people need to hear that. There's a lot of people, in my opinion, that are raising money that have no business doing it because they don't know what they're looking at. They don't know how to do the due diligence, none of that. And they're bringing their investors in to what they think is maybe a good deal, but they don't even know why it's a good deal. They just don't have a clue. They've never invested in these deals themselves. They've never ran these deals themselves. So if you don't have the experience, and even if you do, like Jeff, you've got a lot of experience and you're still using other people to help with your due diligence. You're still, uh, you know, just not relying on your own expertise. And, and there's so many people that are relying on their own expertise when they have none um, oh, to absolutely. look at these deals. I look, I look back. I mean, I'm so glad that I went the direction that I did. Um, because I look back to where I was when I was first buying properties and raising money. And I knew nothing about, about running the business. Um, yeah. you know, I mean, I went through a guru mentorship program, but really that's like getting your, your driver's permit. Yeah. You know, you don't learn it until you're actually in it and just learning how to run a business. This is a business it's, and it's a people business. It's working with people. Um, you know, even if you're looking at different asset types, just understanding how to run a business. Now, each asset type is going to have its, 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 uh, idiosyncrasies and, yep. and different things. So you need to learn that as well. You know, if I was going to buy strip malls or I know a guy that's buying medical offices, um, you know, there's so many different nuances just nuances yeah nuances that you got to get in and really find out more about those nuances and why this property is good and why this is a good deal so yeah. very very important to learn that but in all of them in every single asset class the sponsor the team is still the most important knowing the team and understanding the team but you still need to know the asset type yep love it Jeff, we're going to pivot. Got a couple last questions. Uh, what's a what's a good book you can recommend to our listeners? Well, it depends a lot on what people are doing. If there's there's a great book that uh, a friend of ours that I'm sure you you know him, uh, Brian Burke wrote yeah. a while back. You know, the hands off investor, those people that are in multifamily looking to come in as either a passive or an active investor. Um, it's got some great information in there. I usually tell people you read that book and you're never going to want to be active. You're going to want, you know, there's, well, even with the passive, even passive investors going to look at that and say, I don't want to do all this work on the due diligence. Yeah, yeah. And that's where we come in as, as, as we're, you know, we're doing all that work on the due diligence, but that's a great book. It's called the hands off investor by Brian Burke. Great guy. Love it. Love it. Great book. Great guy. You uh, agree with you there. Um, last question. What are your three pillars of wealth creation? My three pillars of wealth creation is putting your money to work. Um, I guess consistency. Due diligence. Making, you know, making sure, uh, making sure you're putting your, your funds into uh, proper deals just off the top of my head. I yeah. guess those are the three. Love it. Love it. <laughs> consistency. Yeah. Consistency is huge. And uh, doesn't mean you're, I mean, consistently investing certainly, but consistently looking at deals and understand, especially if you're first getting into this business, don't go invest in the first deal you've ever seen in your life, right? If you education never seen... is the yeah, education yeah. is the best way to mitigate risk. Yep. Learning about what you're getting into. Yeah. Uh I always tell people, look, get onto a get get look at a bunch of deals. Like look at mm -hmm. a bunch of deals before you invest in that first one because that like that consistency and and the due diligence and understanding what you're looking at is it plays a huge role and whether you're successful or not. So yeah. Talk to other people though. Network. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's important to learn from other people. Um, however you do that, um, you know, it could be going to different, different conferences and learning from other people, but 
working with other people to underwrite deals and yeah. see what they're looking for. More experienced people always try to find people a little bit farther ahead than you are to kind of um, get their experience. That was one thing that I, I wish I would have done when I first started because my partner, we partnered up. Both of us had gone through the same training. Both of us had been at the same level. We were, both of us were, you know, in the dark together. Hmm. Um, and when people ask, I, you know, if they're going to partner up with somebody, I said, find somebody that's a few steps ahead of you, you know, somewhere that, that they're more experienced than you and you could yeah. find some way of being valued to them but learn on the job, but you don't want to learn on the job all by yourself, making all the mistakes, learn from yeah. others' mistakes. Or go work for a company that's been doing go it work for a long for time. Somebody. Yeah. I think that, those, that that's works. great. You know, find something to do, fly out, fly out yeah. and visit properties, you know, yeah. you know, tell somebody you could go and, you know, check out the properties and do some yeah. due diligence or find some way to do something. Um, you know, even if you're not getting paid, yep. you know, just 100%. it's, it's going to be worth it in the long run. Love it, Jeff. Um, this has been great. How can our listeners get in touch with you and learn more about, uh, SIG and what you got going on? One of the things you could scan my, uh, QR code up there, but otherwise you can get a hold of me at Jeff at synergetic IG.com. You can go to my website, which is synergeticig.com. And uh, those are some ways to get a hold of me. Awesome. Jeff, again, really appreciate it. Thanks so much for coming back on the show. A lot has changed since the last time we talked. So really appreciate you and uh, the value you've been able to add. Yeah. And I do have a, I do have a freebie that they could also get, yeah, which is questions to ask before you invest Ooh, I um, a sponsor. And that's at um, S-I-G-C-R-E dot com slash sponsor. And that will get you some uh, questions to ask before you invest with a sponsor. Awesome. That is super valuable. Really appreciate that. And again, have a, have a great rest of the day, man. You too. Thanks. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.